on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name's Jubal Handrich. I'm one of the elders here at the church. Um, for those of you who do, you already knew that. But this is my second official Easter sermon, so you'll have to bear with me this morning as uh, I've only been able to do this two times, and this is one of those times. Uh, but I just am very excited to be able to preach to you the gospel this morning. Uh, I say this because today specifically, when preaching, you have this privilege that, that you don't really get any other day. You see, today you have these three powerful words that you can say that makes everyone in the crowd react automatically. It's really cool. Um, these, these three words are like, ingrained in all of your mind of as soon as you hear them you it triggers this unconscious response of like i have to I have to say it and so so with that on this this resurrection sunday i just have to say the words he is risen, he is risen. see it works every time it's crazy and and this this he is risen the beauty of this is that you guys get to participate in the sermon. Like, how exciting is that? It doesn't happen every week. But this morning, you guys get the, the pleasure of doing that. And, and we commemorate and, and say these things because of the importance of this piece of Christianity. The fact that he is risen is, is so vital to our faith. I didn't even mean it that time, but you guys are... You guys are on top of it. It's good to, it's good to see. But, but to start, I want to start he, with, the, with the familiar story, and, and Jason finished it for us, but I want to go back a little bit before that to, to earlier on in the week. Um, if you want to open your Bibles up to John 13, that's where we'll be, we'll be starting this morning. Um, we'll be beginning with chapter 13, verse 1, and we'll move nearly to the end of the book of John, actually, as we walk through these last days of Jesus' life and, and kind of what leads up to what we know for today for in, in the resurrection. And so John 13, uh, verse 1, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, all of this was happening just before the Passover feast. And, and we talked about this some last week, and, and if you were a part of the Maundy Thursday service, you may have heard a few more things about this, but the Passover feast was a celebration of Jesus, or, or God, taking Israel out of captivity in Egypt. And in the Passover, we know the story of the angel passing over the doors that had the blood across them. And so within this Passover time, we see Jesus preparing a meal for, for his disciples and talking to them about that and, and prophesying what was to come. The, the beauty of it is, is the Passover was Israel out of Egypt, but, but Jesus came for a different purpose. See, Jesus still freed us from bondage, but instead of bondage in Egypt, he freed us from the bondage of sin that we all have to live in. And, and so it's fitting that right before Jesus' death, they, they celebrate this and, and commemorate that. But, but moving forward in John 13, if we move to verse 34, Jesus was talking to his disciples during this Last Supper and then sometime into the next day. And we actually have a large piece of scripture over a few chapters where Jesus is, is commanding his disciples kind of how to live before he leaves and goes to the cross. And I pulled just a couple of verses in John uh, verse 34. Jesus said to them, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, these were some of Jesus' last words to his disciples before he went to the cross. Love one another. I mean, he didn't pick these words because they were meaningless. He put these specifically here for us to look at and for the disciples to know. This is really, really important. Love one another. Love as Jesus has loved. 
Love as Jesus is going to show us he loves. And, and so as we look and as we move forward through this life, we have to kind of piece it based on this foundation of love that Jesus is, is reinforcing to his disciples. That is this huge key facet of the whole deal that why he's doing what he's doing, why he's going to the cross. But, but after Passover, we move forward and into the Garden of Gethsemane. And so we skip to John chapter 18 now, verse 1. And we see Jesus in the garden. And it says, When he finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he is this, and his disciples went into it. Now, we know Jesus spent time in this garden praying to his father and preparing for ultimately what was to come. But it skips straight forward to verse 2. It says, Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And, and here we see the betrayal of Judas. Jesus ultimately betrayed by his disciple. And we see the plan of the crucifixion truly starting to take its form. Nothing really made sense that Jesus was talking about up to this point. But now that he's been arrested, this, this process has started. The, the plan of, of where Jesus will move forward from here is beginning to form and and as the soldiers arrested Jesus they took him back into the city and, and they bring him before uh, first the high priest the Jewish high priest and then ultimately before Pontius Pilate and if we skip forward to verse 28 we see then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas who was one of the high priests at the time to the palace of the Roman governor so Pilate came out to them and ask, what charges are you bringing against this man? And they replied, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And they replied, no, we have no right to execute anyone. And we see right there, Jesus was going to die. That was the plan period at this at this point and this took place in verse 32 it says this took place to fulfill what Jesus has said about the kind of death he was going to die so Pilate went back inside the palace summoned Jesus and asked him are you the king of the Jews Jesus replied is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me to which Pilate responded am I a Jew your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate responded, You are a king then. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world to the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate retorted. And with this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Thinking at this time, Pilate was like, all right, so, so I'll give them a, a way that they can get Jesus back off of this whole thing because there's nothing wrong here. But, but it kind of backfired on him because the people, they said, we do not want Jesus. Give us Barabbas. And, and there's a whole story behind Barabbas that he was a murderer destined for the, cru the crucifixion. But Jesus instead was put in his place. This ultimately was the final death sentence for Jesus. The people of the Jews had officially asked for him to be executed by the Roman government, not because he had done something wrong. Even Pilate said he couldn't fault him with anything. And we know that he lived the perfect life. But ultimately it was because when he came, he spoke the truth. He testified 
to the truth, and the world does not want to hear that. The world did not want to hear the truth that Jesus came and spoke to, to all of them. And so after beating him and, and putting him through public humiliation and embarrassment, they, they crucified him. And in John chapter 19, verse 16, we read, So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his cross, he went out to the place of the skull. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. And, and this we remember as Good Friday, the death of Jesus. It's funny to think of that as Good Friday, but ultimately Jesus' death was a perfect sacrifice for us. His death was offering redemption to the entire world. And that's why it was a, a good Friday, that he came and shed his blood for our sins. But John 19 is not the last chapter in the book. No, no, the people mourned on Friday, but, but Sunday came soon enough. And, and when Sunday came, when today is here, we say, he is risen. Good job. And so we'll finish with John chapter 20, and we'll move to verse 11 in that chapter. And this is a little bit of what Jason had read about earlier. Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. They asked, woman, why are you crying? And she said, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbi, which is teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And, and with this, the story can be finished. So let's take a moment to, to pray, and, and then we'll conclude our message from there. God, we just thank you so much for this story, for the gospel, the good news of you coming, living, dying, and, and ultimately being raised from the dead for us, because of your love for us, that you would offer a way that we could be in right relationship with you, the God of all the universe. I pray that your spirit would work through the hearts of the people here in this church this morning, that, that it would truly fill them with your presence, that they would feel your spirit working in them, and that they would carry out the power of your spirit with them as they go, as they, as they move into these different places of their lives, God, that they would remember this Easter Sunday, this gospel of what you've done for them, and that it would ultimately change their lives that they would serve you wholeheartedly because of this realization of you being willing to die for them. And so we, so we pray before you this morning that you would open our eyes and our hearts to, to your will for our lives, God. And we do all these things in Jesus' name, amen. And so we have this story, this foundation, this gospel. You know, the whole book is about this Right here, this day is what it's all about. And, and I want to talk about three points within this day, within this moment, this happening. And those three points would be, first, confession, second, repentance, and, and then finally, sanctification. And these are all big Christian words, so I'll try to explain them a little bit as we move through this. First, we'll start with confession, and we hear this commonly within Christian circles. Confession is sometimes described as agreeing with God. It's, it's maybe admitting to him that he was right all along and, and we were not. 
Confession is us confessing that we need him. It's us admitting, accepting, realizing that without God, we are nothing. But, but confession is kind of a twofold thing here. As, as Christians, yes, we confess our sins. We, we speak them, we say them, we ask God to forgive them, we confess them. But, but we also confess Christ as Lord. And that's what I want to talk about with this. In Romans 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, a process of of salvation is the confession of Jesus as Lord. And this this is more than simply making a statement. This is more than just saying Jesus is Lord. This is confessing. It's more involved than just speaking. It's admitting. It's believing. It's allowing the core of what's in you to truly accept and realize that these things are true. And within that, confession also ultimately demands action. When you confess something, it should change the way that you live because it changes what you believe to be true. Think about a knight swearing fealty to a king. He's confessing this king is his Lord and ultimately choosing to lay his life down for whatever the king asks of him. Maybe someone moving into military service does the same thing. They're confessing that the the government, the country that they're working for or committing to is worth dying for. That's whatever they say, that's what they're going to do. And that is the process of confessing Jesus as Lord. The, the question comes up, though, is why would we ever do that? Why is Jesus worth confessing as Lord? Well, well, if we look at the story I just read to you, that's good enough reason for me. If we look at what Jesus did for us, Jesus came to save us. And it wasn't because we had done anything. When, when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, all of us weren't even here. We didn't do something that prompted God to come and save us. No, God came to save us before we had done anything. Ultimately, we were born sinners. But God, who is rich in mercy, came to save us in spite of the sin that we commit against him. And if that isn't reason enough, we can look per se, at some of the people who was around Jesus after he died. You see, Jesus had 12 disciples who who walked with him while he was on the earth. And if we look at their lives after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, we see a common theme. All of them but one were martyrs for the faith. They all died preaching that Jesus was the only way of salvation. And the one who didn't die... He wrote a few books, you may have heard of them, John, a couple other ones named John, he liked to write after himself, I guess. He he was exiled to an island, and the reason that was is because they tried to kill him, but it didn't take. So finally they put him out there so that he would just die alone on this island. And, And so we see that all of these people who were around him, who looked and saw what he did, This was real. This wasn't a fake thing that happened. This was a real commitment that all of them saw. And we can look at those people for examples of of how and why people thought this, this whole thing was the real deal. When we read the life and we see the power of the Holy Spirit... And and see it working in us, we can't deny it either. We must confess Jesus as Lord, as ultimately He is the only way to heaven. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You see, Jesus is the only way to the Father. So we must confess him as Lord. And we, so we start with confession. And then we move into this piece of, of Christianity, repentance. Because you see, though we confess Jesus as Lord and then we strive to live a life of service to him, ultimately, all of us fail. We fall short. We, we sin. 
And a part of confessing Jesus as Lord is, is ultimately owning up to those shortcomings and allowing Christ to forgive us when we are in those positions. And that, that can be very difficult because, because for me specifically, I, I don't want to admit that I did anything wrong. But repentance says, no, you need to admit to Christ that you did something wrong, that you messed up, that he can forgive you, that you need a Savior. That's what God wants you to realize. He wants you to see that you are in need of him, and and repentance is not a once-and-done thing. It wasn't something that happened the day you were saved, and, and it never happens again. Repentance is a lifestyle. It's a constant act that we partake in. We live a life of repentance as Christians. And if we need an example of this, we we look in the Bible and we have the whole Old Testament that talks about this. We see Israel constantly going through this this cycle with God, where they're in good standing with God, and then all of a sudden a bad king comes, or they make a bad choice, and and they fall into exile. They, They get taken over by another nation. But God, in his mercy, brings them out of that, and they repent of the sins that they commit and and commit themselves back to God. And then a few years later, they fall into this this same cycle. And we can see it in our own lives as well, that we have these highs, these moments where we're just in great standing with God and things are going really well for us. And, And then all of a sudden we look and Things aren't going quite so well for us and we haven't talked to God in a long time and and our lives kind of shifting from where we thought it was before and we come back to this repentance and we get back into this right relationship with God and that's that's a part of the process of Christianity. It's we know we're not perfect. All of us can gladly admit that. Sometimes we're too glad to admit that. But but when we're not perfect, we realize we need a savior. Because we're not the ones who are going to do it. And if we need a New Testament example, we have to look at the book of Acts. This is the early church. When, when Peter was out preaching, I believe this is Pentecost, he said to the people around him, Now fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would, would suffer. He's talking to the Israelite people about crucifying Jesus, which they had just done however many days or years earlier. This is probably a touchy subject, but he, but he goes right in. He says, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets. But don't just accept it there. In verse 19 of, of chapter 3, he says, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The process of repentance brings refreshment. It brings you back into this close relationship with God that you should desire. Because you know when you're out of it, you lose that refreshing feel of God. And when you come back into that, you feel his arms again around you. It brings you that refreshment. It reinforces the fact that Jesus truly is your Lord. And this brings us to our final point. First we confess and we repent, and ultimately the fruit of those things leads to sanctification. And sanctification is the process of of our lives becoming more and more like Christ. And I have a few verses that I wanted to, to present with this topic of sanctification. The first out of John. I had a lot out of John this morning. But chapter 17, verse 17. Jesus says these words. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And so a key piece of sanctification is the word of God. We're sanctified by the word of God. When we fill our lives with it, it sanctifies us. Knowing the truth of Scripture, being in relationship in prayer with God, sanctifies us. It allows us to see the truth that Jesus presented to all of us. It allows us to be sanctified by God. Another one, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, it says, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let one who boasts, 
boast in the Lord. And so we're, we're sanctified by this word, yes, but we're also sanctified by Christ. He ultimately is the one who's brought us righteousness. He's brought us holiness. He's brought us redemption. He sanctified us by his death on the cross. And then, and then fulfilled that through his resurrection, proving his power over the grave. And, and one final verse of sanctification comes out of Ephesians chapter 5. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And so again, we see that as a church, all of us, the group, God's people, not just individually, but as a people, we are sanctified by the resurrected Christ. God's will for his church is that it be pure, is that it be blameless, that it be holy, and he'll go about cleansing it. He works in our lives individually and as a church to purify us for his will. And that process is how we are sanctified for serving him. We, we're sanctified by his calling on our lives. Now, in the beginning of this message, I, I first presented to you the gospel, the good news that Jesus came, lived, and died on the cross to save you from your sins. And all of you, I would say, probably have heard that story. Very few people who walk into a church these days haven't. Jesus lived a sinless life and died for all of us and then was raised again. And so for us sitting here now, we're left in this position. We've learned this gospel, this good news, this truth of what Jesus did. And now ultimately, all of us have a choice. We have an option, a decision that we have to make in response to this truth. You see, we can deny this. We can say, no, he didn't do it, or no, I don't need a Savior, or no, this isn't the way that it's supposed to work. Or we can accept what the Bible says. We can accept that this is the way that it's presented to us, that the good news of Jesus coming and dying is for me, is for the fact that I need a Savior, that I fall short. That Jesus came and loved me specifically and died for me specifically, that I could be in right relationship with him. And we, we have this option, this decision. We can choose to believe Jesus' death and resurrection or, or, or to walk away. But if you feel the Spirit knocking on your heart, if you feel God's presence working in you, I'm just going to tell you right now the same thing I told Joe, you'll, Joel. You'll get tired Resistance is futile when we come to Christ working on us. When, when God has a calling on your heart, allow him to change you. Give in to what it is that he wants to do. Give in to the Spirit's work in your life. Confess him as Lord. Allow yourself to be changed. Repent. Be in need of a Savior. Repent of the sinful life that you've lived and continue to repent as you seek to serve and follow him. Allow the Spirit to change you from the inside out, to change your heart of stone to a heart of flesh, one that, that loves and is willing to serve him. And maybe you've already made this choice. And if that's you this morning, I have maybe a different challenge for you. And that's go. Share this gospel that you've heard. Preach to those around you, to the world around you. Be the light, be the church to everyone around you that they may see the love and know that you are Jesus' disciples by the love that you show them. And ultimately, when you're in that, serve him. Not for yourself, don't boast in yourself, but do it for the Lord. Rochelle, would you like to come up and close?
As we sing, He Lives, I invite you to stand and sing together. We serve a risen Savior. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever man may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving and though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing. 